For a number of years, I've wanted us to have a very nice visual, something artistic, either in the narthex or out in the courtyard that would explain how a clown became the logo for a church. That artistic endeavor hasn't happened yet, but it's a good idea because a whole lot of people, especially visitors, have no, I no idea why a clown represents Asbury Memorial. Some people think it's strange, especially since our culture through novels and movies has turned the original intent of a clown bringing joy and happiness into one that brings horror and fear. Stephen King did us no favor <laughs> with his 1986 classic novel, It, which personifies evil as Pennywise the circus clown. The novel has been made into a movie and miniseries, so we are constantly seeing that clowns can do something bad. One of the main origins of twisting the clown image into something sinister happened in 1940 when DC Comics created the Joker as a villain for Batman. Oh, yes, I love Batman. <laughs> I know you do, Brian. He's one of my favorites, too. He was followed by Cesar Romero bringing him to life in the Batman television series, followed by... Jack Nicholson's famous portrayal of the Joker in a 1989 Batman film, followed by Heath Ledger's memorable performance in a 2008 Batman movie, and now, coming out next week in just a few days, is a new movie about the Joker played by Joaquin Phoenix, whose performance is supposed to rival Jack Nicholson's and Heath Ledger's, which means it will be very scary. In this culture of sinister clowns, it's very difficult for our poor little clown to connect with people as he tries to offer them light and love. Yeah. The evolution of our clown started in the 1970s when a group of women decided to meet for a time of fellowship. They said, let's do something constructive during this time of fellowship. Let's put our time to good use and we'll make something and we'll call ourselves the busy bees. And one of the la ladies, a woman named Frances Howe, had a pattern for a clown doll. So they decided to make clowns out of material they would sew into circular patterns called yo-yos. Back in the day, Asbury was famous for their church bazaars. People from all over the coastal empire would flock here in the fall. They would buy things for Thanksgiving or get Christmas gifts. My family didn't attend Asbury. We attended another church, but I so vividly remember my mother and sister being excited about going to Asbury's Bazaar. And the clowns were sold there. And caught on and then a few stores in town started selling them and so when this church started losing members in the late 1960s and then throughout the 70s and the 80s and when membership drastically shrank and the church couldn't pay its bills guess who came to the rescue the busy bees and their clowns when I came here in 1993, there were about 30 active members. And in hoping to turn things around here, there were three aspects of our faith I wanted to emphasize. One was being all-inclusive, that everyone is welcomed here. Secondly, was to emphasize the joy of our faith, the good news, the gospel, that Jesus came so that we may have life and have it in its fullness. 
And then the third thing I wanted us to emphasize was creativity, the arts. You know, the first thing we know about God and from Genesis, from the Bible, is that God is a creator and that we were made in God's image. And so we are created to be creative, artistic beings. And so I was looking for an image that would represent joy and creativity, but I also wanted us to honor, to lift up those faithful members who stayed here at Asbury all those years, even though they were told it was impossible for the church to ever thrive again. I didn't want to leave them behind. They needed to be part of this transformation. So we needed a logo that would link our past to its present to its future. And the clown doll was perfect. It represented joy, the arts, creativity, and it honored our elderberries. But there was another aspect of the clown that had me excited about it. The clown had been an ancient Christian symbol long before the writers of the musical Godspell chose to costume the character of Jesus as a clown. The clown, or the holy fool, was part of our ancient ancestry. In the first chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he wrote, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And then in the fourth chapter, he wrote, we are fools for Christ's sake. Some of the early Christians became known as holy fools, desert people, or other saints who would give up their worldly possessions and join monastic orders. These holy fools or fools for Christ often use shocking and unconventional behavior to challenge accepted norms, to deliver prophecies, or to work for justice. Just as everyone was too scared to say the emperor has no clothes on, the holy fool would be the one to exclaim, the king is naked. So there is an element of the prophetic voice from holy fools, much in the same way that the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures are John the Baptist, are Jesus, were prophetic. In fact, they could also be considered holy fools. Why would the Son of God allow himself to be humiliated, persecuted, and nailed to a cross? That's foolishness. And so Christianity involves a lot of foolish thinking, upside-down thinking, upside-down living. And perhaps there is no better example of this than the Beatitudes that Steve read for us today. The Beatitudes are at the very beginning of a section of teachings by Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we don't hear too much about the Beatitudes these days, yet they are at the very heart of Jesus' teachings. Mary Prokop sent me a cartoon one time of a sad-looking Jesus holding his head in his hand saying, I give them the Beatitudes and all they read is Leviticus. Vocal Christians sometimes demand that the Ten Commandments be posted in public buildings, but I never hear anyone cry out for the eight Beatitudes to be posted. And I think we can all guess why. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just the opposite of what our culture tells us. Instead of defining success in terms of 
power, wealth, and status, Jesus turns things upside down and says it's the ones who are poor, the ones who are grieving, the ones who are downtrodden that have a special place in God's heart that are blessed. One thought as to why Jesus did this reframing is because at that time, many people believed that one's state in life was ordained by God. That is, if you were wealthy and powerful, it was because God favored you. And if you were poor, if you had a lot of problems and heartache, then you were disfavored by God. Perhaps you or your ancestors had done a lot of sinning and now you were being punished. But here Jesus is debunking all of that. He's saying that the downtrodden are actually the ones who have a special place in God's heart. Now it's important to note that Jesus is not referring to what will happen to people after they die. A lot of people think that's what's involved here with the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are not a, well, since you are poor now on earth, since you are suffering now, things will be better for you after you die in heaven. The Beatitudes are about the here and now. They are about what happens within us as we live them. They are Jesus' affirmation of what it is to be of God. Just Jesus' disciples knew what Jesus wanted them to do. He wanted them to love God and to love neighbor. But what does that exactly mean? Love them how? Well, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount unpack that for us. They give us the details. Do the, these things live this way? Commit to these eight spiritual attitudes and you will receive a deep and abiding sense of fulfillment and sense of personal happiness. That's what he's saying. And the key here, the key is to let go. Let go. Our instinct is to want to be more, to want more, to gain things. But the key, Christ says, is to let go. Let go of ego. Let go of self. Let go of possessions. Let go of wanting more. So that you can be more in touch with those around you. So you can be more in touch with those in pain, with those who are suffering, those who have little. Let go of trying to do it, doing, to do it alone. Let go of thinking you can do it alone. And recognize that you need God. That you need God and you need other people. This kind of transformation requires that we begin to put on the mind of Christ. We ourselves begin to think like Jesus. We face what it means to be just in an unjust world, to be meek in an arrogant world, to be humble in a domineering world, to be compassionate in a prejudiced world, to be full of grief for those who suffer, compassionate for those who are oppressed, then this truly spiritual soul sees the world as God sees the world and sets to do something about it. It is the purpose of religion, you see, to help us understand and to affirm and then live out the meaning of our lives. Why you are here. Why you were born. And so one day, at the beginning of his relationship with his followers, men and women who had walked away from what they were doing, walked away from their old meaning and purpose of their lives, one day Jesus takes them away from the crowds and sits down in the middle of them, sits down as a rabbi always sits in the midst of his students, 
and the clear purpose of the exercise is to teach them. Teach them something about the meaning of their lives, what they were for. It's a new definition of what human life is about, and it's radically different from what the world offers. Instead, you are blessed, you are deeply happy when you love enough to become poor in spirit and meek and hungry. When you love enough to experience pain and grief, when you are willing to lay your life on the line for God and God's kingdom on earth. And so the question comes to each one of us, what are you for? What is your purpose? What is your meaning? And the invitation is to take a long look at how you are defining your life. To let go of the frantic striving and to follow him, the one who will direct your paths. Now, this is a personal, individual invitation. This is not one of those sermons where we should say to ourselves, I wish so-and-so was here with me today in church. They could surely hear what Billy's saying. You know, it's an illusion to think we can change anybody else but ourselves. The truth is that we cannot change them. We can only change ourselves. We need to remember the alternate version of the serenity prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change. The courage to change the one I can. And the wisdom to know it is me. And so for you, and only you, let me read the Beatitudes to you one more time. This time from Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible called The Message. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and God's rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you, only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. God's food and drink is the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right, then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete and fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution, the persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. I just heard this morning that the Desert Fathers would memorize all of the book of Psalms, all of the Psalms, and would re recite them every day. And one of them said, it's like water on a rock. I know if it keeps dripping and dripping and dripping and dripping on that rock, it will one day change it. And so I encourage you to read those eight Beatitudes every day so that it gets into your heart, and your mind, and it will.
God bless you as we seek to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, especially the Beatitudes. Amen and amen.